Hey, you guys. Uh, we, uh, it's good to have you here again. Uh, I hope this has been uh, a helpful and an inspiring day for you, new ideas, new people, and so on. And that is one big part of why we do Pulse, but it's not the most important reason, of course. You do realize this. <laughs> So uh, the main goal of, of doing this, of hosting this gathering, is uh, it was printed on all the literature, connecting arts to the heart of God. Yeah. So it's, it's our conviction, and I know it's, it's many, uh, I hope all of yours, is that connecting arts to the heart of God, connecting your gift, your passion for some kind of creative expression, uh, is most importantly rooted not in techniques, or networking, uh, it's rooted in a, in a close, personal, deep sense of centeredness and rootedness in the story of the gospel and in, in the presence of the God of the gospel uh, who is available to us through the Spirit. That's the point. Amen? <laughs> Amen. And so what we thought we would do in this last session is not put any new ideas or new things on the table, but actually uh, put something that we all already know. Uh, on the table, namely the story of the gospel, but also create, uh, create a moment and a space for you to reflect on whatever God's been doing in you today or whatever he's doing in your life in general. And uh, so that's what we're going to do. For, uh, we've got some time and uh, we're going to briefly remember the story of the gospel and then retell it symbolically through the bread and the cup and close our day in worship and in prayer and in communion. Does that sound good? That's good. So uh, the story, there you go, the story. Uh, where does it begin? I'm sorry, that's a dumb question, of course. Sorry. And Paul already laid that one on us. Of course, it begins in, uh, in the beginning. Uh, the story, the grand fairy tale, the ultimate true fairy tale, as Tolkien put it, right, uh, is the story of this, this marvelous, this wonderful being who's mysterious and unknown, and, and this being out of pure generosity and grace decided to share the grace and the reality of his own being with us in this thing that we call creation, right? And this being obviously has a, a deep fascination with color and form and shape and Nebraska <laughs> and, and also mountains and, and other things. And part of the crown, crowning moment of that creative story is that the creator makes these, these divine image-bearing creatures, creatures who will express uh, the, the will and the creativity and the love of the creator and to represent the creator in, in this, this world. And uh, these creatures in, in the Bible are known as Adam, or as humanity. And he gives these creatures a royal authority. He tells them to rule. He tells them to steward, to work, and to care, to guard, and to manage the resources of, of the world that he's given them, to do so under his wisdom and under his grace. This is how things go in, in the beginning. And how things, uh, how long do things last? <laughs> At least is the good, the good part of the story. It's like a page and a half in, in, my, in my Bible. I don't know about yours. And, and so the, these humans, they're mo we're moral agents. We're given so much freedom. We're given a world of beauty. And what do we do with these gifts and resources and talents and time and relationships? And this is, the, this is where the plot thickens, right? The tragedy of the story is that we take these riches of experience and life and, and we turn inward. We're given a choice to trust the Creator's wisdom about how to be a human, how to be an image-bearing creature, and we, we, we seize the opportunity to, to use that for our own advantage, is what Paul was talking about. And we all do it. We all do it in different ways, and we all do it every day. <laughs> and this is the dilemma. This is the dilemma of, of the first humans. This is the dilemma of every human Sense. And so it just raises this huge problem because this world of beauty that's full of places like Nebraska or the Sierras or, or crazy deep sea fish that are beauty and mysterious, but it's also a world full of pain and tragedy and hunger and, and divorce and sexual abuse and death. And so the creator, out of his passion, out of his deep love for our broken world and the broken humans in that world, he sets in motion a plan uh, to send the hero. And the sending of the, of the hero 
It takes uh, a long meandering, <laughs> uh, long meandering way to tell that story, right? And so we know most of that story. We call it the Old Testament. <laughs> But God chooses a human family. Because remember, the whole point was that it's the humans are the ones through whom God's will is carried out in the world. And so he begins with a human family, the family of Abraham. He, he, he makes this family the, the family of promise through whom blessing, through whom the hero will come. And these humans are just as broken as all of the rest of the humans that God wants to give blessing to. And so now God has two problems on his hand because he has a broken human race and then he has a broken people group called Israel who are supposed to be the people of the blessing, right? And, and so some days they follow this God who's revealed himself in the Torah and in the scriptures and some days they don't. In fact, that's most days, right? And and we read the story of, of the Old Testament and we think like, man, if I was rescued out of Egypt, there's no way I would ever turn my back on that God. And then you've fallen for the trick, of course, <laughs> because the whole story of these broken Israelites is holding a mirror up to every human being is saying, you, you have been given the gift of life, the gift of breath, the gift of your relationships, your talents and your abilities. And how's that going for you? <laughs> living a life of gratefulness and devotion to the Creator. And so in the story of the Old Testament, we find our own brokenness played out over and over and over again. And it raises this huge dilemma. Who's going to win? God's commitment to, to bless and to save and to heal or human brokenness and sin and selfishness and rebellion, a story we have all participated in. And so the climactic moment comes in the story of the hero. And the hero is, is not someone we would ever expect, of course, because he's fully human. He has to be. That was always the point, is that God's will be carried out through image-bearing creatures, through the humans. But the fact is we are all incapable of, of doing what God has actually called us to be and to do. There's something broken so deeply inside of us. And so the, the brilliance, the mystery, the surprise of the story is that the creator becomes human. This is a unique, unparalleled moment in the story of, of the human race. And the creator comes among us to announce the kingdom that the way God always meant things to be has finally arrived, that it's here and that it's present in and through Jesus of Nazareth, God in the flesh. And some people welcome the announcement of God's kingdom. It's typically the people at the bottom, the people at the margins, the people who have been excluded from the kingdoms of this world. And the people who get most ticked off at Jesus' announcement of the kingdom are precisely those who have a vested interest in keeping this world exactly the way that it is. And so he's welcomed by some, he's praised by many, and he's hated. He's hated eventually by even more. He comes uncompromising in his holiness, as, as Robbie C. says. And we hate him because of it, because he exposes the brokenness and the selfishness that lay in our heart. And so in the ultimate you catastrophe, as Tolkien would say, right? The ultimate happy disaster, the crux point of the story is that the creator lays down his own life to absorb the pain and the selfishness and the evil and the violence and the death that we have all collectively created into himself on the cross. And he lets it do its worst. It takes him to the grave. But because of the creator's passion for you, for our world is stronger than death. He conquers death. He conquers our sin. And in the resurrection of Jesus, the fairy tale comes true, right? That the ultimate power of love and life is stronger. That death does not have the final word. Your selfishness, well, your, your issues, right? The tragedy of pain and death in our world doesn't get the final word. Not with this God and not, not in this story. And so the rescue takes place in this paradoxical, paradoxical way. We die with the creator at the cross so that we can be given new life and new grace. And so in the resurrection, the story doesn't end, actually. It becomes a new beginning. As the, 
the Creator in Jesus of Nazareth commissions those who have been transformed by an encounter with Jesus to go out to announce this story of this God giving new life. And it started with, with 12, it started, it went out to 120, it went to 3,000, and then here we are, 2,000 years later, sitting on the other side of the planet, and what are we doing? We're telling the story, right? We're part of the story. And so you, with the talents and the abilities that you have been given, the opportunities, the community of Jesus you've been placed in, you are a participant in this ongoing story. And you've been given a sacred task. If you've got a creative bone in your body, (laughs) you have a sacred task as a follower of Christ to live in this story, to let it shape your heart and your mind and to find ways to give voice to it in a million different creative expressions. And we do so in the hopes that the creator will return, that Jesus will return and set all things right, which will involve bringing an end to pain and to evil and to injustice and to selfishness and sin and healing our creation and healing our broken hearts. And the story is just getting started at that point. I wish I knew what comes next, but I guess we'll have to wait to find out, right? So that's our story. That's the story that we have to offer our world. And if we're going to be people who tell that in a million different creative ways, it will not happen unless you have rhythms of constantly kind of centering yourself, rooting yourself in that story. And that was the great gift that Jesus gave us as his followers with the bread and the cup. We're retelling with these sacred symbols this, the, the climactic moment, the crux moment of the story. These symbols represent the crea- creator's love for you and his commitment to redeem and to heal you in our world. And so what we're going to do uh, is just open up, uh, open up the front uh, for you to come at your own pace over the next few minutes here. I'll give some instructions. But this is a time for you to just lock into whatever God's doing in you and how this story is shaping you, what God is teaching you, and, and what he wants you to be doing with your gift and your opportunities. And so we want him to meet you, and he will meet us, as he promised, uh, in the bread and the cup. Uh, We're going to still have a large block of time here. There's absolutely no rush. Um, And how we're going to do this, allow me to kind of give some some instructions here. Um, There are going to be people up here serving uh, the bread and the cup. Actually, it's uh, it's really cool. The artists that we have uh, come here, three of them, Rory Noland, Sarah Groves, and Troy Groves, uh, they all have already served us by being here and sharing their hearts with us, but they would also like to serve communion to us. And so there are three stations up here. Uh, one will be right here at the front, one at the side, and one here. And at your own pace, you can come by yourself. You can come with a friend or with a group, and it's going to be kind of old school, like bread, tear off the piece, dip it, that kind of deal, you know? And whatever you want to do by yourself or, or group in that moment, if you want to pray around the bread and the cup for a moment, that's totally cool. There's no, there's no rush. Uh, if you're here with a group, maybe from your church, and you would like to come as a group and lead, your, one of you wants to lead your team in that, uh, we have a, the kind of the, the, to my right, to your left, uh, the station over here, and there won't be anybody there. That'll be open if you want to come with a group uh, and do communion on your own there. That's totally totally cool to do that. Um, We are also, to summarize what we're doing today, I'm going to invite up uh, two artists. One is Courtney Kaiser, who's going to bring some finishing touches to our community painting here during our time of worship in the bread and the cup. And then also Corey Rosensteel, uh, who is a potter, is going to be uh, throwing some vases and pots up here on the the platform. So I'll invite uh, Corey and Courtney to come up. I don't know where you are, but uh, you know. And then Troy and Sarah and Rory, uh, if you guys want to come up here. So this is your time. Again, there's absolutely no rush. Come and go as, as you like. But this is your time to pay attention to what God uh, is doing in and through you, uh, through the story of the gospel as we gather here today. Uh, these guys are going to play more music. And uh, let me just close in prayer. And then the time is yours. 
Lord, we thank you for for challenging our hearts and minds. We thank you for expanding the horizons of our imaginations with the story of the gospel, this great tale that you're weaving in our world and in our lives. We thank you for the various ways we get to participate in that in communities of Jesus. And we just, uh, some of us here are tired. Uh, Some of us here are beaten down. We are totally uninspired. Uh, Some of us just need to hear a word from you. We need to feel your presence. And so we just ask you to meet us here uh, as we experience the retelling of the cross in the bread and the cup. Uh, We give our hearts to you. We give this time to you. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.